a desperate man takes on federal agents in a dramatic four-day standoff. I'm a cowboy. I'm coming out like a cowboy. Before going down in a hail of gunfire. <laughs> September 2004, Bowling Green, Kentucky. A barn burns to the ground and four horses die. An investigation by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, or ATF, points to arson. The main suspect, Russell Sublet, a 41-year-old ex-con who works tending horses in the area. During the investigation, Special Agent David Hayes learns that Sublet may also own a sawed-off shotgun, another possible charge against him. I made contact with uh, Russell Sublet and he agreed to meet with us. On the afternoon of September 29th, Sublet is at a local hospital visiting his father and tells Hayes he can meet him there. Kentucky State Troopers Jonathan McChesney and Chris Spradlin are brought in as backup. He was known through the police community as being a subject that any time you deal with him, you want to be on high alert and be ready for, for anything. No sooner do they arrive at the hospital when Sublet is spotted leaving. We saw him actually pull out of the parking lot and start going down the road. At that point, we took off out of the parking lot in an attempt to make a traffic stop on him to make contact with him. Dashboard cameras in both police cars roll as the troopers turn on their flashing lights. But Sublet does not slow down. I realized that he had no intentions on stopping. As the hot pursuit continues southwest on a busy two-lane road, Sublet guns the motor even faster. I remember one, one time looking down at my speedometer and we was running at right at 105 miles an hour. To stop Sublet, Trooper Spradlin attempts what's known as a pit maneuver. We pull up alongside of the, the, of the suspect vehicle, try to match my front corner with his back corner and spin him out, take him off of the roadway. He evidently saw what I was doing and he came over into the left lane as well and he remained in the left lane. Incredibly, Sublet begins playing a potentially deadly game of chicken. He just tried to hit two more cars head on. Driving head on into oncoming traffic. I think he was so desperate at that time, he didn't care if he took his own life or anybody else's. A few miles ahead, troopers on the ground have deployed a chain of spikes across the road to deflate Sublet's tires. All four tires are out. He's still trying to run, though. They were effective as far as deflating the tires, although they didn't stop Mr. Sublet. Sublet loses control of the car and hits another vehicle. When he had struck that car, I thought the pursuit was going to end right, right then. I didn't think that he was going to be able to go. I knew it was a, a pretty hard impact. His badly damaged El Camino conks out a minute later. I noticed him coming out of the window of the uh, El Camino, he began shooting. We began to return for it. He ran around on the other side of his vehicle, and it was at that point I noticed a white vehicle coming towards us. A bystander pulled up, unknowing to what was going on. He ran up to the driver's side window of her car, placed the firearm to her head, opened the door and pulled her out of the vehicle. As the driver escapes across the road, Sublet commandeers the car. Myself and other units began firing into the vehicle in an attempt to stop him from fleeing. He placed the vehicle in reverse, began backing up. Sublet drives the stolen car a few miles before he suddenly veers off the road and smashes through a white fence. Crossing a wide lawn, he steers the car out of view of the dash cams and straight toward the front door of a mansion. When I seen him exit the vehicle and run into the house, I realized whose house it was and where he was going. He had a purpose for being there. Sublet has driven to a house he knows well. The owner was one of several clients for whom Sublet tended horses until days earlier when he and the homeowner had a falling out and Sublet was fired. First thing we were wanted to find out is, is there anybody in that residence? Sublet's former boss is reached on his cell phone. In a stroke of luck, he and his family are not at home, but he warns agents of an extensive gun collection in his basement, now at Sublet's disposal. I think there were over 20 uh, firearms that he had access to. 
Uh, they included handguns, they included shotguns, they included high-powered rifles. If we had tried to storm the place, somebody was going to get hurt. So the, the decision was made to just wait him out. Special agent in charge Carl Stankovic joins more than 120 agents now at the scene. That residence was located on 15 acres of property that was pretty much wide open. Using his vantage point, Sublet opens fire on law enforcement. I could hear rounds hitting light poles. We could hear things pinging off every time that he would fall. You could hear at, at different points rounds hitting different places. Power and water to the home are cut. To track Sublet's movements, several robotic cameras, normally used by bomb squads, are brought in. They were able to uh, maneuver the, the robots inside the house to see which areas of the house he was, he was using more, uh, whether it be the first floor or the basement. It was obvious that uh, he had done severe damage to the house itself. He was taking out his anger at, at that owner and previous employer. You could also see and read his body language to try and get an idea of, of where he's coming from and, and what his thought processes are. The robot cams allow negotiators to talk to Sublet. Get the camera on the face. But Sublet shows little interest in chatting. When he did charge, he would fire the shotgun. So our special response team members were protecting themselves by returning fire. With negotiations stalled, agents tried tear gas to get Sublet out. It never seemed really to have an effect on him. Uh, he was always able, I don't know, to evade it or found some area where it, it didn't uh, come in. The stalemate continues into the night, through the next day, and into another. On the morning of the fourth day, overtired and dehydrated, Sublet starts talking to negotiators. The conversations captured by the robot's camera. I've got a f life, man. I've worked my ass off. And give everything I got to people. And, and, and get free like yeah, man, I'm ready to go. He had been in prison before, uh, said he didn't want to go back, uh, didn't have a good relationship with his son, with his wife. I don't have no hard business, but I'm not going to lay my gun down. I just won't let it in this way, you know it. Uh, of course, he'd, he'd lost uh, the job uh, from the person that owned the home. He thought his life was going in a downward spiral. You guys are doing a hell of a job trying to keep me from doing what I'm about to do. But man, I got to do what I got to do. I'm a cowboy. Not coming out like a cowboy. Sublet is shot, the bullet tearing through his shoulder. But he still refuses to give up. Russell had a reputation as being a pretty tough guy, pretty physical person, very strong person. Um, I'm not too sure he realized what it would feel like to get shot. A half hour passes. Slowly, Sublet's attitude begins to soften, especially after negotiators make a simple gesture. Yeah, appreciate that. Sublet opens up to one of the negotiators. Bowling Green police officer Michael Delaney. Captain Delaney actually knew Russell Sublet prior to this incident and knew him. Uh, they played sports together. I need to rest, man. I've been in pain since so long. I just can't take it anymore. I mean, the pain that they've done to me, shooting me, ain't near as bad. It's what is going on inside my head. My mind, right now, they think. You know what I'm saying? Think about the future and, and getting past all this, putting it behind you. You're strong, you can do this. Delaney's words seem to reach Sublet. After a four and a half day standoff with an army of agents, Russell Sublet agrees to surrender. 
that point he realized he had things to live for. Uh, he had family members. He had people that cared about him. His life wasn't as bad as he initially thought. Sublet even has kind words for law enforcement. These guys are super great. I mean, they saved my life. After a three-day trial, Russell Sublet is convicted of five counts of attempted murder. He is not charged in the arson case. Sublet is sentenced to 140 years behind bars. It all happened so fast. It wasn't until after it was over that you really stop and process what all had, had just taken place. This could have ended in a real tragedy. It could have involved several people being hurt or killed. Uh, it could involve uh, Russell being killed. In that respect, it turned out as well as could be expected.